This video is going to take a look at symmetric shear in open thin wall beams. We're going to start with the beam shear formula from the previous video. So let's just take a quick look at that. So shear stress uh, at a point y1 uh, from the neutral axis contains uh, a term to do with the applied force, the shape of the beam, the width of the beam at y1, and then an integral from h to y1, so from the top of the beam to the point we're looking at, of y, the distance from the neutral axis, times the elemental area. So we're going from the top of the beam down to this point to give us the shear stress at this point. For thin wall beams, it can be convenient to uh, think in terms of something called shear flow, which is the force per unit width of the beam. Uh, we call it Q, and it'll be the shear stress times the thickness. We can rewrite the beam shear formula. Uh, so the shear stress is Q1 over T. DA becomes thickness times the length along the section we're looking at. Uh, and given that that's got a T in and B uh, is the thickness, then those two cancel out, and we get this formula here. These zero and one subscripts uh, are as we go around the section of the beam and they'll become clearer in a little while. Let's think about the shear flow uh, in an I section beam. Uh, this one's subject to a, a vertical transverse load um, and if we explode the schematic uh, at a cut section we can examine what's going on with the shear. So we've got the obvious shear flow at the vertical edge here, that's the reaction to the load. And from what we talked about in a previous video about complementary shear, it means we must have shear in the top and bottom faces like this. This means that reactive shear flows must act on these faces, and in turn complementary shear flows to those have to happen on these exposed faces. These have to dissipate to zero at the free edges because there's nothing to react against them there. You can use this approach to envisage the shear flow in any section you want. To apply the beam shear formula in this way, we need to make the following assumptions. Direct stress is constant across the wall thickness. There's negligible shear stress across the wall thickness. And the shear stress along the wall is constant across the thickness. For those assumptions to apply, you want a thickness to length of the wall uh, less than 1 in 10, uh, ideally 1 in 20. Uh, so we, we call this slender. Um, the area of the section can be assumed to act at the center line of the thickness. And the first approximation of the second moment of area can neglect secondary terms in the parallel axis sum. So, for example, for an I section here, the BD cubed upon 12 contribution from the webs is much, much smaller than the AY squared. So the web contribution uh, simplifies to this. That assumption doesn't apply for the flange, so we use the BD cubed upon 12. Shear flow follows some simple rules. It's zero at the free edge because there's nothing to react it. It's uniform across the thickness, continuous around the section, and it follows the center line of the thin wall section. Note that the sense of shear in the beam walls is determined by S, not by the projection onto the XZ and YZ planes. For an I beam with a vertical transverse load through the shear center, the shear flow distribution looks like this zero at the edges increasing to a maximum at the middle of the web. Um, and note that we conventionally plot it outward from the section uh, in either sense. If you were following a, a positive anti-clockwise sense of shear, then uh, it would actually be in the opposite sense uh, on either side of the web. And as you go along the web, uh, you get this curved profile. Note this isn't symmetric about the centre because the, uh, the beam itself uh, isn't symmetric, so the neutral axis is going to be down here. And again, it goes to zero at each end of this flange. 
Here's some examples for some more common sections. So for a symmetric I-beam, the shear flow in the web uh, tends to a maximum at the centre where the interlaxis is. Same for the C-section. Uh, and again, note that where you've got webs joining flanges, then the, uh, the shear flow has to go around that corner. So you're going to have identical uh, shear, shear flow. Um, and the T-section follows a similar sort of pattern, going to zero at the free edge here. Uh, and box section is slightly more complex. Note that for symmetric sections, it's symmetric about the axis of symmetry. Um, and it's probably worth committing some of these basic examples to memory. Just a quick note about these diagrams. Uh, the convention is to plot the shear um, increasing in magnitude outwards from the section. So uh, for, for this box section, even though in uh, reality we have a, a positive shear flow here and a negative shear flow here, you'll plot them both going outwards uh, and make sure you indicate the sense of the shear with the arrows along the section. Next, we're going to introduce the concept of a shear centre. And one of the examples in the Beams 2 lab will really help you get to grips with this. For no twist, a transverse load must be applied through the shear centre of the section. And that's a position through which a transverse load causes translation, but no rotation, no twist. The shear centre won't necessarily coincide with the section centroid, um, but for some simple sections, the shear centre can be found by inspection. Let's go into a bit more detail about that. Uh, if you have a doubly symmetric section, uh, like uh, a simple I section, the shear centre will be at the centroid. For sections with two intersecting sides, the shear centre is always at the intersection. Make sure you memorise those two points. For any other type of section, then you need to look at it by uh, balance of the shear flow and torsion. So broadly, in this section, we have shear flow in this direction. And they all create uh, a twisting moment in the section. So if we want no twist, just translation of the end of this beam, we're going to need to apply our force um, away from the centroid of this section. Um, and the point at which we need to apply it through is called the shear centre. And we can find this distance E by equating the moment about any point um, of the external force through the shear centre to the moment of the resulting internal shear flow. So taking moments about this point on the web, the moment S times E has to be equal to the sum of the moments in the uh, top and bottom of this C section here. The web doesn't have any contribution because it's going through our reference point. Uh, so that's two uh, sections, the top and the bottom, times the shear flow in the flanges, times the Y distance, integrated across the breadth of that flange with respect to S, our distance around the section. For the flanges, Y is constant. Uh, so that two times this distance uh, just becomes H, the height uh, of the C section. And replacing the shear flow with its definition from the very first slide, we get an expression that gives us E from that initial point that we took moments about. This is a tricky concept to get your head around, but make sure you go back through the derivations and have a go at as many worked examples as you can um, to, to get it all straight.